Welcome to the Monday, December 27th Talk About Our Democracy Zoom meeting. Participants include Nick Biddle, Dan DeWalt, and Woody Bernhardt. Nick is a retired professor of Latin American history and a Brattleboro resident. Dan DeWalt is director of restorative community practice of Vermont. Dan lives in Newfane. Woody Bernhard is director of We Celebrate Democracy, Civil Rights for All, a nonprofit dedicated to positive, nonviolent public action for democracy and civil rights for all people. Woody lives in Marlboro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the talk about our democracy meeting on Monday, December 27th. And the subject of today's meeting is what can we do for democracy? And uh, welcome to Dan, DeWalt and Nick Biddle. The uh, plan for tonight is I'll make a presentation and then we'll open it up for discussion. As far as what we can do for democracy, I've really been consumed by that question ever since uh, Trump was elected. Um, and I've tried a few things. Uh, one of them, um, I guess you could say all of them really centered around the uh, We Celebrate Democracy, Civil Rights for All banner, which has been up over Main Street 25 plus weeks since then. It's also been photographed in front of a number of Main Street businesses and people carried it in the 4th of July and strolling of the Heffords parades. And residents have posed with a banner in front of post offices, uh, five US post offices and postcards of the events have been made and distributed to the public. Brattleboro Democracy Forum and talk about our democracy uh, in Marlboro meetings have presented ideas and discussion about democracy. I'd like to say thank you at this point to the many donors who have made all of this possible. Personally, I love what the banner says. And um, I know I've had a conversation uh, with you, Dan, about, about democracy and supporting democracy, um, <clears throat> where you expressed the view that democracy is so screwed up that you can't support it. I don't know if you remember that conversation. <laughs> Well, I, I was saying that we don't, we, we haven't had one yet. We haven't really, yeah. I, I, I support the concept, we, but we, we don't know what the, in our own history, in our own country, we can't truly say that we've ever hit it yet. So yeah. um, I'm not, I'm supporting a concept, but I, um, yes, I, I, and I hope that we can arrive there someday. Yes. Nice to hear you say that. I do. I feel exactly the same way. <clears throat> as far as what uh, one of the things we can do for democracy is to uh, expand on your idea that we we could improve democracy and it could be doing a better job and um, that I, I don't know I think it would be good for for all of us for all the people and for the planet. Speaking about what we can do for democracy, I, I, I read an article by Jill Lepore in the New Yorker on uh, February 3rd, 2020. I forget uh, exactly uh, what the title of that article was, but uh, Jill wrote that in 1937, a contributor to the New York Times wrote, that the future of democracy is the number one topic in the animated discussion going on all over America. In legislatures, over the radio, at luncheon table, in drawing rooms, at meetings, of forums, and in all kinds of groups of citizens everywhere, people are talking about the democratic way of life. In 1937, George Denny Jr. of North Carolina launched America's town meeting of the air. 
an hour long debate program broadcast nationally on NBC radio. Subjects included, does the US have a truly free press? Should schools teach politics? A lot of these will seem like we're in the present moment. The debates were broadcast to listeners gathered in public libraries across the country so that they could hold their own debates once the shows ended. In 1935, the superintendent of schools, John in uh, Des Moines, Idaho, John Studebaker, started opening local schools up at night <laughs> so that citizens could hold debates. The meetings began with a 15 minute, minute news update, followed by a 45 minute lecture and 30 minutes of debate. The idea was that the people of every political affiliation, creed and economic point of view will have an opportunity to participate freely. The program eventually came to include almost 500 forums in 43 states and involved two and a half million Americans. And subjects for these debates included, should this power of the Supreme Court be altered? Do company unions help labor? Do machines oust men? Must we get out of the East? Can we conquer poverty? Should capital punishment be abolished? Is propaganda a menace? Do we need a new constitution? Should women work? Is America a good neighbor? And can it happen here? W.E.B. Dubois, an American and Ghanaian sociologist, socialist, historian, etc., said, it seems to me that this is the only method by which we are going to achieve democracy in the United States. That method being getting people to talk about it. So I'd like, just like to shout out to Jill Lepore to thank her for that article, uh, which I think says some great things. In Brattleboro, in the, in the Democracy Forum, uh, Tip Kim, Tim Kipp said that he would offer a vision of what real democracy looks like, but he won't be presenting until February. I can't wait to hear his vision. I really would like to talk about what a real democracy would look like. Obviously, as you said, Dan, and uh, we haven't seen it yet and we don't know what it would be like. And we, I think we really could benefit from exploring what it would be. A literal translation of democracy from the Greek is people rule. Well, not right now. <laughs> and we don't know what it would look like if people did rule. Tim Kipp has pointed out in previous Brattle Democracy Forum presentations that since the founding of this country, uh, it has been the case that <clears throat> democracy really meant to the founders rule by the wealthy, the privileged, and the slave owners. Tim said that capitalism is anti-democratic and anti-democracy. He also says that in order, to fix, in order to fix democracy, we have to look at what's wrong. In other words, we have to deconstruct it in order to make it better. 
And Nick Biddle has shown us that the US government through the CIA has undermined democracy by putting puppet governments in control in Central and South America. And we see around the world, people <clears throat> being kicked off their native lands so that corporations and the global economy can profit from stolen resources. There are a number of PDF presentations, that is Brattleboro Democracy Forum presentations on BCTV and YouTube. Please check them out. Dan DeWalt's presentation, Restorative Justice in the Age of Trump was one of the first of the presentations on the forum. So what can we do for democracy? Well, I've done my bit in, my, in Brattleboro and you have too, Dan, and so have you, Nick, but it seems like it hasn't been enough to restore democracy to the United States. And now we're faced with the ultimate environmental disaster, severe climate change, brought on by our profiteering ways. I'm pretty sure that all people affected by climate change, me included, of course, would prefer to have it end and would vote that way if given the chance. Increased catastrophic weather events, tornadoes, torrential rains, etc., are threatening our survival. And why are they happening? We all know it's rising CO2. And where does that come from? We all know 87% of all human produced carbon dioxide emissions come from burning of fossil fuels. 29% of that carbon emission comes from transportation. The re remainder results from clearing of forests and other land use changes, as well as some industrial processes. So, I guess we can say, well, if we don't have democracy, can we say what we should do to address climate change? COVID showed us that just stopping the global economy would clean up our water and our air. But, the corporate world and global trade cannot survive if we do that. So the powers that be are working to keep things as they are and their profiteering may kill us all. But I was thinking that there, there is a way out and that I already talked about part of that being stopping the global economy. And we, in order to do that, we have to transition to a reliance on local economies for the production of food and consumer goods. And I think that's the way that we're gonna have to go. I think it's gonna take a real long time, probably 50 years to do that, but I think that we could do it. So that concludes my presentation. If you guys have anything that you'd like to say, I think that would be great. There's so many, like, like first to democracy, I think we have, there's two, two things we have to be balancing and thinking about at the same time. One is the, you know, trying to conceive of what actual democracy would look like and how that would actually work and how, you know, let's say just within the context of, 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 our, of our nation, you know, there are lots of things people say, you know, if we get rid of the Senate, if we, if we have all town meetings, just, you know, so to think of how that could work in, a, in an ideal world. But at the same time, 
and probably even more immediately pressing is what do we do about this representative republic that we have now, which is so flawed and controlled and corrupted. And we see how people are trying to, at least in the house, you know, try to make inroads. And there are, there are some progressive people who are trying to, to make a change and they have a really difficult time. And so I think we have to back away, pull away from that and start building our democracies right here in our villages, in our towns. We have to really start involving people in what it takes to, to make our local communities run. You know, what it makes to, takes to figure out how, where we're gonna get the gravel for our roads and what it takes to figure out what, what's the tenor our, our select board meetings are gonna have and, and what, what are the attitudes we're gonna have about um, newcomers to town and, and what are, attitudes are we gonna have about um, economy in the town and, and what to encourage and what to discourage. And we are, we are so out of practice of engaging in those activities that we don't do a very good job of it. And I, and I think if we wanna foster democracy, we have to, to re-energize people to know that they can actually have a voice that matters and makes a difference and they can learn how to exercise that voice and they can learn how to work with other people on a local scale that then would be absolutely sizable, um, um, scalable up to, to a larger size. And I think that uh, we, the thing that's keeping us from doing that is the consumer society that we have now is all about distracting people's attention, giving people the notion that they can be fulfilled by the stuff that they have. And it's been highly successful and the advertising is brilliant and, and brilliant minds go into convincing people that they need the latest iPhone or an iPhone period or whatever. And that's, it's successfully distracted an entire culture and influenced other cultures ac across the globe with this consumerism, which is antithetical to building a democracy. So we have to, and, and I think on a local level, when you're dealing with in a small town where you have an issue in the town that people are affected by, and then they actually are given away, shown, shown away that they can take some of that power to have an influence in those decisions, that's exciting. That's as exciting. As, as a good movie on Netflix or, or is getting a new piece of crap from Amazon, you know? So I don't know, I think, I think we need to really start working locally and we it's, it's the concept that we have to do. And, 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 if you, and if you go to global warming, it's like the same thing. We have to, like you, you use the phrase, um, uh, go back. And I think, I think yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily use the phrase go back, but we have to, we have to change our expectations in the world and the planet of what we're supposed to you know, what we're supposed to deserve or what we think we have to have to have a life and we have to simplify we have to actually have less you know it's not like oh we can we can have all the stuff we have now and cut global warming i don't think so we have to have and do less so that doesn't mean we don't have less fun it doesn't mean we have less enriching lives in fact Probably the opposite is true. We've been, this, those distractions that are costing us money and time and giving us stress and angst and, and um, all kinds of problems, they, they're, not, they're not giving us very much satisfaction. The idea of having less, of giving up things and not having these conveniences, not having these things is a frightful thought. But I, I firmly believe that if, by seeing it as a, as a it's, it's a better solution, it's more fun. And it's more meaningful, and I think I think that that's some. I don't know how you convince people of that, because the consumer culture is a, a, it's, it's as big or bigger a juggernaut than than you know the government, because it's ultimately it's all the capitalistic package rolled in. So, but I think I think we have to be thinking of people's the way they approach the world, the way they think about how we belong in the world, how other things belong, and what does a tree mean in the world. What does a plant mean? What does another person from another country? What does our neighbor, a person, you know, we're not thinking at all about those things, let alone thinking deeply about them. And I think that's, that's what needs to change. And that, that's, a, I don't see why that's not exciting. Why, why that can't be fulfilling as a society to do that work. But that was a lot, sorry. It sounds, it sounds to me as though it would be a, a lot more f fulfilling than being a, a very dedicated consumer which I, in my experience ha, has uh, turned out to be sort of a shallow and empty uh, experience. Whereas uh, actually 
being a participant in changing or figuring out how uh, things should be going in your town or in the world, I think is a much more exciting thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I don't know if we lost Nick. It looks like we oh, might. Oh, I'm right here. I'm right oh, here. Cool. I'm just making sure that Dan, you know, spoke uh, his first round. He um, did. Yep. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to go backwards um, uh, from what you just said most recently, Dan, up to what uh, you said, Woody. Um, ain't it the message of our lives to persuade the culture that having less is more fun and more meaningful is that not what we have been why we come to vermont what we do this for so we've been playing this line in our lives in our souls mm -hmm. for, you know like a couple decades or more um as we look out from Vermont to uh, New England and beyond, very quickly, you just go to Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, then you go down to Boston, and, and you realize immediately just what you said, Dan. Um, if human expectations for a continuance of consumer bounty are somehow or other like like threatened literally people literally they go bonkers they get yeah. really they, they, they go violent for you which i think is kind of resonant with the uh the organized uh you know invasions of, of department stores in california i mean we're, we're facing this new covid moment and so what do poor people in in, in you know outside of san francisco do they get gangs of 80 to 100 people and we're going to get Nordstrom's or whatever and we're, we'll break in there and grab our Christmas gifts and, and literally Christmas gifts, fill suitcases with Christmas gifts and leave. We don't want to hurt anybody. We just want our Christmas gifts. There could be hardly any other example of a greater consumer addiction. I was in Argentina in 1989-90, in which the government collapsed, the currency collapsed. I was doing research uh, there and I saw a dead person who had starved to death on the street once, you know, one time. First only person I've seen a dead, starved human. I witnessed a lot of, of uh, misery, but I also witnessed three times in which I'm walking down the street in front of a grocery store and I see a dozen guys and several of them have bats and they march into the grocery store and four of them hold their bats and hit a couple people and the other eight of them go and get groceries, not Christmas presents, groceries and bring them out and there's a truck ready and they leave. So when desperation exists, you see these acts. The weirdness of the current that what I, you know, the California stuff is that the desperation is about consumer madness, mm. consumer weirdness. This is where we, this so called culture is and changing it <laughs> is, um, is just like. Uh, more than Herculean, it's, you know, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I, you know, I, I have lost even the possibility of thinking about, I have 18 year old granddaughter, 15 year old grandson, really smart kids. They're right there in the culture. They have one friend who's died of fentanyl overdose, another friend who hanged himself. Um, they know what it means to be in this world now. Mm -hmm. And the desperation and the weirdness and the in the absence of expectation and the and the climate coming down, they know what they don't know. They don't know U.S. history. 
because why would you do that? It got us here. It's a, so it's a very difficult and, 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 and quizzical uh, challenge. As their grandfather, <laughs> I'm trying, but I'm their grandfather and I live 3000 miles away. I don't get a whole lot of exposure, um, but and, and Greta Thunberg and, and that, you know, so the, the only hope is youth. And the only hope is that youth across the globe just say, F you, we're not taking this anymore, you know? And, and that builds to the, to, you know, to back to where Woody begins when he talked about, you know, the poor's argument or her, her article. Every, every, every example you, cited Woody is from the depression. Mm -hmm. It's from PR's new, you know, new deal. Mm -hmm. And in 37, Hitler was had already taken Czechoslovakia. He was just about to take Austria and then into Poland and it's all over. Yeah, we're all beginning, however you want to look at it. And and so it, you know people understood what democracy meant in 1937 yep. way that has no meaning right now, none whatsoever. And so um, we're in a dark, dark moment. And, um, and because you started with 1937, Woody, I'll say the same thing. Um, that began in 29 with the depression and it was only that which overturned the gilded age that started in the 1870s and built through the roaring 20s which was the absurdist creation of income inequality in the history of the united states and then the depression destroyed a good court you know portion of that one percent and then and and everybody else sort of fell into it. And then, and then we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, the great exception. He is the great exception. Increasingly over time, I am completely seeing him and his presidency as the absolute unique moment in US history where democracy becomes the only organizing tool mm. for the crisis that is being confronted. Because the United States has the technical or documented structure for being democratic, it can avail itself of those constitutional mechanisms in an emergency. We're close. We're witnessing. I mean, it, we all feel like we're in an emergency, but we're not, obviously. Otherwise, We'd have streets in the crowd, uh, crowds in the streets, a lot more frequently. We have them fairly much, but not, not and not recognizing. And that's the thing. Other thing, Dan, that um, what the depression did is make it very clear that we're going to have to live with less. And so, living with less became a uh, accepted truth. So you live with less. And you make you make democratic relationships, and you know so many of the wonderful institutions and history and music and that we we respect and and, and esteem in our lives come out of those uh, de depressed and and economically deprived mm -hmm. um, scenarios that so many people across the United States endured but they did so with a open mind and an open heart and in the hope that franklin roosevelt was able to to, to you know galvanize and and, and create and I, you know i mean it, so we're kind of left with a sort of a uh i don't think we're going to organize ourselves around this you know and i mean i love i love our, you know, our, our, you know, guard, our far, farmers markets. And I love the, I love everything that the state is trying to do, but it's not going to be enough. Um, we're not, 
capable of keeping more than one in three graduating teenagers in this state for the next 10 years, two out of three of them have to go find work outside of the state. That just happened. That's true. Um, so local politics aren't going to do it, mm. but they are still and always a model. I mean, you know, that we're here, we're doing it. We're do this is part of it, right? This second, what we're doing right tonight. And so, you know, not to stop, not to stop, just don't have high expectations. Um, and understand, I think, personally, this is the way I go about it, um, that a much bigger thing is on its way and it's under, you know, we're witnessing it every second. We may never even make it because of COVID or something, you know. Uh, we may never get to the opportunity to endure a kind of cataclysmic depression, kind of fall of the stock market, i.e. 1929, re, re, you know, parallel um, uh, event or set, you know, uh, we may or may not. Um, in, in, in a way that we can keep continuity, continuity of our, of our documents. And, you know, and those of us who remember what we learned when we were 20 and 30 and even 18, um, that's, that, you know, it just might not happen, but I do, we do hope it happens, which, you know, and it could, and I'll tell you, and my best, and you know, and I'm, you know, I've been do, saying this for a long time, many decades at this point, but I got to say that even the CIA agrees that we got 10 years before the world turns into chaos because of climate crisis. That's their estimation. Um, and uh, so, What's happening now is just really the beginning, you know. Um, you know, we're in the midst of the beginning of changes that will either decimate us in a way that we can't recover, or stimulate and motivate us into a uh, a a energy for recovering what was the promise of something called the United States of America. Mm -hmm. and, you know, now it's one of your turns. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think another aspect of this, whether, you know, with, with, whether it's local, I mean, if there's one locality trying to do something, and that's it, that's one thing. If, if this happens in lots of places, it can spread. And whether it spreads, it can be successful. I don't know, but I've spent, I spent a lot of time battling against things. You know, I tried to impeach Bush and this and that and the other thing, you know, and uh, didn't stop any wars, didn't impeach any presidents. I feel like uh, building things is making way more sense. And, and as, and I think you're right, as, as things deteriorate, it's gonna be much harder to prevent just a breakdown of society. And I think one of the keys to that is we are losing trust in each other because, largely because, if not wholly because, of the media we all consume. And so people become, they, they have, we've really started to demonize, and this is on the left and on the right, the other, you know, the other, the other people on the other side. And, and in, in New Fane, I, uh, just uh, three or four weeks ago, we had our first uh, community circle conversation between some progressive people and some conservative people. And, you know, on the, on the topics, they were on opposite sides on multiple issues from, from COVID issues to political issues, you name it. And we just, we just went around, went around the circle and then people were explaining where they, how they developed their beliefs, why they believe the things that they do. And at the end of that meeting, every person uh, said and understood that everyone else in that room was like, you know, a thoughtful person. There wasn't a demon among us. And they all thought that it made sense 
to do something like this again. They thought it would make sense to do it with you know, other people and have other members of the community. Because, and, and these are, and, and I organize this and I'm, I'm, I have a very obvious bent on my things. I write junk so people know where I stand. And so I would be talking to conservatives, which I am not. And it didn't matter, you know, because what I was talking to them was about was communicating and having a chance to talk about what, what how they came to be what they are. And so, you know, talking with, with everyone who participates ahead of time, this isn't about, uh, this isn't a contest to see who can persuade whom. This is a chance for people to talk to each other and find out that they're human. And, you know, and if, and if someone's not ready to listen, they don't get invited to one of these circles. And, you know, that's your job in setting up a circle. You, you try to talk to people and, and, and find people who are ready to listen. But I swear, I, this is something, because if, if, if some really nasty stuff comes down, let, let, let's, say, let, let's say, you know, somehow coup number two happens. And let's say by some miracle, my, my plan to try to block the bridges on Route 30 and Williamsville comes off, right? I know that some of my conservative neighbors who will think I'm absolutely out of my mind and will be infuriated will still, I will not be a demon. I will have, I have a relationship. I've built, we have all have a relationship. And, and if your town, all aspects of your town builds a relationship over whatever, the, the weather, what you what you grow in in common, what the town you know how we get the, again the gravel on the roads you know the, we had a, we had a, a meeting recently New Fame bought a gravel bank, you had a, you had the whole gamut of, of of all sides of the politic political alley and and it was a unanimous vote everybody agreed this is a good idea, you know that has meaning, every you know people in that meeting know who was there they know who, oh that's the first time you and I've agreed on anything, <laughs> you know but I. That builds, and I think that has more power and more promise, as as much promise and power as any other any other thing we can do. And, and we 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 don't we can't stop thinking on the national level and the international level and the global level. But I think that that what what builds a movement is success, and what success can be achieved is starting right around this, and and uh, and how to do that is getting people to listen to each other. I commend you, yeah. and I and I and I very much enjoy uh, exactly that narrative. Um, I remember the gravel conversations. I I uh, spent a uh, number of years in Westford, Vermont, way up northeast of Bra Brattleboro. I mean Burlington, um, and gravel was a. Um, and that and and you're right. These are the relationships in your world. I mean, this, these are the humans who are you know you see in the day, and you want them to uh, to to have at least have a sense of who you are. And that's that's uh, that's extraordinary. And you also, I love um, the notion that thoughtful people, even if they are Trumpsters, um, can get to will come together and 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 explain their the, the sort of the derivation of their belief system that to get to organize that that's that's an achievement my friend um and i am not that aged i haven't got those roots here in brattleboro i you know i um and i retired and came here in 2013 and blah 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 so I just know Vermont because I was, you know, here for so long, and then I came back, and 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 I love it. That's why I came back. But and and so I commend you. I mean, if you could, if you were able, if I mean, if if somebody gave you two million dollars to do to reproduce this, for instance, just a just a for instance, do you would you be would you think? Uh, and, and and gave you the two million dollars, you know, uh, on uh, on uh, on the condition that you try to reproduce those conversations across the state and then across the region, et cetera, et cetera. Would you think that would be useful? Oh yeah. In fact, I'm I'm doing this. I'm I'm the director of restorative community practice of Vermont, it's a nonprofit that teaches restorative practice and does conflict resolution. And so this is our project to do this. And in fact, the, the Vermont Community Foundation gave us I think 2000 bucks to support us in general. Um, I, I'm not getting paid to do this, but you know, like, so it is getting some support. 
we are actually reaching out in other towns. So we're trying to do this. And, and it's funny, we, we went to towns and, and, and tried to present this, right? And like, who are you? <laughs> you know, so it, and that, and, but in my own town, I could do it because I knew who I could contact initially. And we're, and we're making inroads in another town right now. And, we're, and, we're, and we'll, we'll probably be eventually able to successfully do in there. But that's where you really need to have folks in local individual places take the initiative. And like my organ our organization would support, like if somebody wanted to do that, we would support it. We would co-facilitate, we would do whatever was you know, helpful to, to, to enable something like that to happen. But I firmly believe, I mean, that's the goal of this organization is for people to listen to each other. You know, restore to practice. Take a, take a 50 hour training so you can learn how to listen to each other. I don't know if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. It, it, it boggles your mind because you think that's something we all do, but actually it's something hardly anyone does. And so it's, it's again, it's, it's a mindset change and, and you can, it can be done. Is that what you guys do is you have a, a, a training session, how to listen? Well, we, we train restorative practices. So it involves nonviolent communication. Our, our particular little uh, amalgamation involves nonviolent communication and restorative circle facilitation. That's, that's the kind of stuff we train for. And then we do those things in the process of doing circle conflict resolution for people. And yeah. then this community conversation is, is not either of those formal things, but it's on the sort of, it's on the same principles of listening and what that really means to listen. And so, so you, you learn these things by doing them and you, and you have a chance to do them when you're engaged with an actual conversation with someone instead of slugging talking points from MSNBC against talking points from Fox back and forth on a, on a digital screen on Facebook place or yeah right 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 so i'm starting to think that you're either a psychiatrist or a psychologist but I, I don't answer that um i'm also starting to understand that you know the point that i think we're talking about and from is that human interaction and human uh, relationship one-to-one -one, like literal one to one mm -hmm. and one to two and then one to 10 um, is in actuality what uh, I guess uh, you mean by having less and having it be more fun and meaning more. And I agree completely. And so that is as you also acknowledged re relative to what I, you know, my little comments at the start, um, that means more locally. That means more to an actual, so here we are, why don't we do things that are mean more within the space that we get, you know, the, the, you know, and, and, the, and the place that we've chosen? Absolutely, absolutely. But as you also acknowledge, it's not going to change even the states, let alone the federal, let alone the international scenario of the unfolding of, of stuff. I think that's, that could entirely be true. However, if we successfully lobbied the state legislature to make the sort of practice a requirement for a teacher's license in the state of Vermont, that would make a huge difference. I mean, you know, there are lots of things you can do within the political framework we have now. There are lots of places where a political framework now falls short. There are lots of things we can do which are symbolic and get you a pat on the back and nothing else. There are lots of things we can do which are meaningful and make a change and are tiny. But you don't know which one of those, like Greta Thunberg going down in front of the place on her Fridays, Yeah, you know, that could have just, uh, we, we, hey, how about us? We How many, people the war. Have done that? How many yeah. times have we done that, right? Well, we marched against the war in Afghanistan every yeah. Friday for a year and a half in Brattleboro. Yeah. We had yeah. drums, we were, we were banging. And you know, yeah. it, it, it didn't end the war. It didn't change a but single But you're just dollar. not 14 years old, see? Well, that, this is what I'm saying. It's like, so, <laughs> so she was at the right person, the right age at the right time. And yeah. there's, the, she has undeniably made a shift in, in, in the, consciousness of, of massive amounts of people across the globe. You know, right. Bernie, after how many years of trying, finally, and in, in the last, you know, eight years or so, 
has helped to actually make a little bit of a shift in the consciousness of this country. So you don't know which one of these things is going to have a greater impact than you realize. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, now we're starting to lead off into, you know, the utility of any particular life. And it's not re totally related to democracy per se. Now we're talking about being a human being in a global world in the moment and, and, and the existential um, value of our existence. Well, I think that's all, yeah, that's, those are the things you consider when you're, but engaging in democracy is, is doing that with other people. And then because of the fact that you're all doing that, then you start to think about what do we need to do to be able to exist here? And then that's where democracy actually kicks in because you have to organize the polis, you know, organize the, what you're doing. Which is out of control. And therefore you're right. You're right, you're right, but we can't control because, I mean, that's why we live in Vermont. We can keep it human scale, you know? You, you, get, you still get to do this, you know? You like head your way down to Harlem and see what happens, right? Um, and, and so <laughs> that's the part that kind of like un, uh, unnerves me, put it that way, in the sense that, um, particularly for people like my grandchildren who are 3000 miles away and they, they live a life of their, you know, in their way um, that isn't Vermont. Um, they're good human beings and they live in a fine place, but, but um, they will endure the polis in its current, you know, context. And this is, it is a, and that, you know, uh, you know, uh, Woody, that that is probably simply un, un like a meteor that's so much bigger than we can, you know, slide away from hitting the earth, you know, um, which, by the way, I just want to plug this because I saw it last night. Don't look up. Um, and that's the premise of the movie. Um, it's on Netflix. It's hilarious. Um, it's a huge critique of us and this whole situation. Um, using the metaphor that there's a meteor coming to destroy the earth and how do how does the government respond to it? Um, so there's, you know, it, I never lose faith in the ability of human beings to be democratic to be respectful, to be in relationship, that is going to always happen. I, I see it across the globe in my travels where I go. It's, it's, it's a human condition and I'm so glad for it. Um, but the United States is this imperial you know, evil that has been from its inception. And as a historian, especially of the United States and Latin America, but mostly from my hist, my, you know, the, what I write about is what the United States did to South America, you know? So it's, it's, I, you know, I understand the United States as the Imperial destroyer. And, and, you know, it's, it's big. It's way big. It's way big. And it's way beyond my, you know, impact or influence and all that kind of stuff. And all I get to do is witness it. You know, like I can, I can talk about it, but I can't do anything else. I, I, the United States, if there, if, if we do have a downfall, which is entirely likely, it'll be, we'll, we'll succumb to our own weight. We'll crumble under our own gigantic. We'll get the so, so, so building democracy on our part isn't about, you know, toppling, the, the criminal capital of state. It's about being prepared to deal with what happens when, when it goes. The you know, whether whether it's due to, you know, look at Chiapas. Look what they have done. You know, in, in the in the face of a corrupt and, and feckless central government, they just kind of set up their own thing and and have actually been able to kind of pull it off. I don't I'm not currently hipped on one, but you know that they have they've set up a different system and it works differently and it seems like it's better for the people. 
So I, 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 that's where I'm thinking. Like, yeah, um, I'm, I can butt my head against a Washington DC wall forever, but my head gets sore. So I would rather um, use it to have a conversation with my neighbors and build something that can withstand the, the crap storm that's bound to happen from you choose your, <laughs> your reason why it's going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and, and, and you know, when I spoke about Argentina in 89 and 90, in 2003, when the when the when the uh, the peso went absolutely through the floor and they lost, Argentina had no money. The U.S. government they stopped paying. Argentina stopped paying the IMF, stopped paying the World Bank. The U.S. cut them off completely. This was George W. Bush. Uh, they were they were extricated from any financial transactions. They had no money, and they got together in the old Latin American tradition. Uh, what equivalent to a town meeting in every town and city across in every plaza in every comunidad within the cities as well as in the towns the smaller towns and everybody just started a barter economy took about a year and the crime levels went completely crazy and only for robbery nothing else you know anybody who had anything it was going to be taken so everybody got used to the fact that we're going to be equalized here pretty quickly, you know, by violence if we don't get honest. And then you get honest, you create a barter system. And, you know, by 2005, the European Union uh, negated the United States and George W. And said, we're going to start doing dollars with these people because they're shipping boatloads of wheat in return, we're giving them boatloads of oil or whatever else they're wanting. You know, we're, we're trading, but we're doing it in a barter system. And that's bullshit because it's hard to record, you know, um, and, and that that won the day because Argentina was so successful. And from 2005 to about nine, Argentina went just it was so wonderful to witness as somebody who's a, a kind of historian of the place. Um, how much pride they had, how much democratic um, joy, and, and there was a fervor of, of respect and equality between each other. Sweet. It was a sweet moment. And it happened again under only this kind of pressure of a kind of survival reality. Mm. So uh, is that, um, Dan, you were talking about Chiapas? Mm -hmm. what, was, what, was, what were you talking about there? Well, they, uh, you know, for one thing, they had an armed rebellion. And for another thing, they organized, I'm not, um, they did like community organization and a communal, they, they, basically it was, they, they created, I think to a certain extent, their own political system, their own economy, they developed a sense of autonomy without being given permission to. Mm. And because of that, from, from the stuff I've read now, you know, maybe I've read all the wrong information, but I have read a few things on it. Um, it seems like it, what they did establish was working better for the people who live there. And there was, there was less, you know, the, the Mexican police uh, general constabulary the, from the army down is, is a kind of a nightmare. And they weren't, they weren't, they'd left it alone because the Chiapas had an actual military presence that was not easily fleshed out, I guess. Mm. So there was a combination of, no, of um, you know, creating a safe zone Sub by whatever means. Marcos, subcomandante Marcos. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was a big deal. And, uh, and they kind of, they kind of pulled it off, even though you would expect uh, an armed group. Well, you would expect an armed group and you would see, you would say in, in America, an armed group would get taken down in a minute. But then you think, oh, well, there was Clyde Bundy. That was an armed group. They didn't get taken down. You know, it's like, it's surprising what countries will put up with. Uh, I, don't, I think for different reasons. Like the Mexican government, I think, just didn't succeed in taking down the, the, the Zapatistas. Well, it's, it's, whereas, a, it's, a low, it's a low impact eco economic uh, zone of Mexico. It doesn't contain, it doesn't contribute you know, Chiapas is the very southernmost province of, Chia of of Mexico. It has no oil. They don't. You know, their, their tax their tax contributions are negligent. 
negligible rather. And, um, and so the government of Mexico cut it off, just let it go. You want to be independent? Well, then starve is the way the government put it. But, you know, they were organized. Um, and Subcomandante Marcos, we now know, was a philosophy professor at uh, the Autonomous University of Mexico in the city. Um, and uh, he had a real, you know, communitarian democratic plan. And he did implement it in a great way. Uh, and, you know, but they already were poor. And, um, you know, so they knew how to survive. These were survivors already. Um, and now they get together and they and they and they have a greater brethren and sister in ship um, because they are resisting the the dinglings, you know. Um, and so that is a great it's a great example. And, you know, Chapas even today still has a, a bit of independence. It's, you know, it's, it's always complicated because it's also the, the passageway of all drugs. Yeah. Um, out of out of South America, you know, Chiapas is the first province in Mexico, so you understand the trajectory there. And um, so there are little bastions of uh, narco control on coastlines on either side, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, um, the people are still they have an integrity. Yeah, it's like integrity, internal integrity and integrity as a unit. They are, they're an integral unit. They've got some, and that's, see, that's, that's what we, in Vermont, we have, you know, we're poor. We're not worth much to the rest of the nation. Maybe there's, maybe it's time to bring back the Second Republic after all, but, you know, in, integrity, you have to have something in common. And if, if you're all of, of the same uh, uh, ethnic group, like, I, I don't know what the makeup is of Chappas, if it's, if it's, multi-group or, or, or you know, you know one, one basic group. But, you know, Vermont has, we have a certain thing that we have in common in, this, in the place that we live and, and, a, and a lot of the people here in the lifestyles we choose, whether we did it from a, from a right-wing background or a left-wing background, we still value a lot of the same things. So right. that's something that's in, that is an integrity. That's, that's a unit. We, we, can, we can build those things here. Well, and we don't have to all be of a like mind to do it. I agree. I agree. A lot of parallels. Yep. Um, and 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 I think that's the best way to look at this thing about democracy at the moment. You know, because there's um, there's not going to be a uh, a place that's gonna like all of a sudden like like. It's not going to just. There's not going to be a social civil rights movement as as close as we are to having one, and we're pretty close. Um, I just don't know. You know, the Republicans are killing it, um, uh, and and so we, you know we're we, we're going to witness what's going to ever happen and whatever is going to happen in in this year, 2022. This year's coming year, and and. Uh, and and just continue working, you know, within however we can, and and then Dan, I you know, I look forward to um, getting to know you better and and uh, being among a session or three or whatever you're up to. Cool. Yeah. Are we at an ending point? I believe we're closing in enough. I don't know. You think we got enough? Oh, yeah, it's great. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> that was very interesting. So it is yeah. very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any final, final comments? Come on, what do you uh, make a few kind of like summary <laughs> remarks? I don't know if I do. I, I think what it sounds like is that we're, we're going to have to be working on the local level. Uh, politically uh, to or or just socially to make connections that Social. will that will Social. strengthen our yeah that will strengthen our communities and um i think that a number of uh 
Well, a couple of people like uh, Hannah Arendt and Jürgen Habermas have, have said that that's, that's what it's all about. That's what democracy is all about. Those personal connections. Public square. The where public you, yeah, square. Absolutely. Where you, you actually know your neighbors. Yep. You share your experiences. Yep. Yeah. And that's democracy. Yes. That's where it comes from. Yeah. It yeah. isn't democracy itself, but it's where it comes from. Yeah. And um, and then as to the representative system, mm-hmm. that constitution, all that stuff, just not going to be able to touch. Yes. And we should let it go yeah. when we recognize that we have to. It's getting close. It's tough. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, very interesting conversation. Really appreciate it. Well, it's nice. uh, I have a I have a few closing remarks that I will be making. Um, However, you guys are not required in order for me to do that. So, if if you want to uh, leave the meeting, that's fine. And I thank you very much for for being a part of it. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Woody. Yeah, Dan, it's yeah, really great. You know, Dan, uh, through Woody, you know, um, let me know more. Uh, you know, we'll get together soon. Yeah, yeah. it was nice meeting you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Woody. Talk yes, you. thank you. See ya. <laughs>